25th select board meeting. Um, we have a number of folks here for public comment. Who would like to offer comment this evening? Anyone? Mr. Kelly. Uh, Larry Kelly, 596 South Pleasant Street. Um, so again, if any of you had need of an ambulance for yourselves or a loved ones on Thursday night, this past Thursday night, from roughly 8 p.m. to midnight, actually more like 8 p.m. to one in the morning, early Friday morning, you would have been out of luck because once again, we had all AFD ambulances tied up at the Mullen Center, and I believe we had four mutual aid ambulances before the night was over coming to the Mullen Center to cart drunks to the Cooley Dickinson Hospital. So that was really almost a five hour period where as far as I'm concerned, we were somewhat unprotected. In other words, when I pick up that phone and I call 911 for my house, for my family, for my little girls, I want AFD to respond ASAP. I don't wanna wait for Northampton, Belchertown, South Hadley, or Holyoke, or something like that. So I came before you almost exactly a year ago, and it was the exact same scenario. It was even a Thursday night a year ago in April when I believe it was Fantasia who played at the Mullen Center, and they too are a techno, strobe light, that kind of an affair. And I think we had, again, all AFD ambulances tied up, but I think the final box score was 15 people transported. This past Thursday, it was 19. And not, all, not only all ETOHs, some of them were like head injuries and other serious things, which I'm sure alcohol played a role in it as well. And then it gets better. The weekend, just this past weekend, what's today, Monday, this past weekend, we had, normally we have five or six transports, ETOH, from New Mass to Cooley Dick. This past weekend, nine of the 11 EMS responses to UMass, nine of the 11 were for ETOH. So again, a year ago I came before you with this exact same scenario and I said, you gotta do something. And I know you are, I know you are. I know you're doing things behind the scene. I know John, you're doing things with the family neighborhood, safe and healthy neighborhoods and all of that. But I'm just here to tell you tonight that whatever you've been doing for the last year, it's not working. And we have a, they have another one of those concerts scheduled in April. So, I don't know. Make a statement. Do something. You know, someone's going to die. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to make public comment this evening? Okay. Then we will take care of a couple of untimed items before we get to our first timed items. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello, Welcome. I'm Ann Lowell, and I live at 22 Lessie Street. And when I got my handicapped parking permit about a year ago, I read the instructions very carefully that you can park somewhere like at a meter and not pay, but if there's a sign that says reserved for the town manager, reserved for the chief of police, reserved for the rector of Grace Church, then you obviously wouldn't park there with a parking permit. Well, last week when we were expecting two feet of snow on top of our cars, I put my car in the underground parking garage thinking to save myself having to clean it off. And I have to say I'm not as handicapped as a lot of my friends I only broke three bones on my ankle when I fell, so I'm recovering. <clears throat> but I'm just concerned that people are not going to feel comfortable parking there because I got a parking ticket in the underground parking garage and my handicap permit was hanging very clearly on the mirror. So, you know, I don't think, I, I don't, I think I've said everything that needs to be said and I don't know if you have any questions. So, but I'm just concerned about other people that might hesitate to park there if there's a big storm coming. Okay, So, thanks. thank you. Ms. Stein. You have my sympathy, it has happened to me as well um, with my, but all you sh should do is go to the downstairs with your handicap permit and show that to them and appeal the ticket. Thank you very much. Anyone else here to make public comment this evening? Okay. So uh, we will start with some untimed items. Um, Mr. Hayden, I know, is going to be late this evening. I'm not sure when he'll get here, if he'll get here before the end of the meeting. But uh, we'll take care of some things that we don't necessarily need to have him here for. Uh, let's see. How about the request to raise the Tibetan flag? This is something that Select Board had last year. I believe we declared March 10th to be Tibetan Day in Amherst every year. But um, we didn't attach the flag request to that. So uh, 
We have a flag request. Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? I move that the select board recognize March 10th, 2013 as Tibet Day in the town of Amherst as proclaimed by the select board on February 27th, 2012 and to permit the Tibetan national flag to fly under the United Nations flag on the North Common on March 10th, 2013. Mr. Eden's not here to second, second. <laughs> for the discussion. Yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. And that is unanimous. One absent. Okay. We have parking and street closure requests for Henry Street. Ms. Stein. This is called the Cushman Village May Day celebration. <clears throat> Okay, I move that the select board approve the blocking off of Henry Street in Cushman Village for their annual May Day celebration on Saturday, May 4th, 2013 from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. One absent. How about taxi licenses? I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi slash chauffeur license for Kim B. Bergeron on behalf of Celebrity Cab Company. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new 2013 taxi slash chauffeur license for Efrain Maldonado Jr. on behalf of Aaron's Paradise Taxi Company. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, one absent. Okay, we have special liquor licenses. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for a reception to be held at the Guinness Engineering Center in Markets Hall, University of Massachusetts Amherst on March 14th 2013 from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Judy Bardwell Clerk, Top of the Campus Incorporated. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, one absent. One more. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for the fifth annual Full Belly Benefit Dance Party in the JCA Social Hall, 742 Main Street on Saturday, March 23rd, 2013 from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. on Andrea Stanley, owner slash manager. Second. For the discussion, Ms. Brewer. I know it isn't on the application, so obviously the staff in the office can't make up things that aren't on the application, but I think it would be appropriate to mention for the record that this is for, as I understand it, Brookfield Farms annual fundraiser, and so I think it's just worth throwing in here that's what it's for. And for just so fundraiser. people are clear, right, it's not a, bit, a fundraiser for Brookfield Field Farm. <laughs> it's uh, for the Survival Center and uh, a couple of other things. Brookfield Farm is... They're, they're, I believe they're hosting it. Yep, they okay. are the organizers of the Thank event. Thank you. And we should okay. probably say who it's benefiting to, but yeah, that's getting wicked complicated. Right, because so we don't have that information. That, you know, for people to say full belly benefit dance party may not mean a lot. Okay, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous one absent. Okay, let's see. So uh, some of this I'd like to put off until Mr. Hayden is here, but let's see what else can we possibly do before he gets here. All right. Um, is here if you want to do that, or we could discuss the calendar. All right. So we can't start the 6:45 item before 6:45. Okay. Um, but uh, let's see. We could do the warrant. We're, we sign that separately anyway. We don't have votes for those. Those are just technicalities, True. right? So we have two warrants to sign, but one of which I think we'd need to put off until after our 7:30 discussion anyway, because. Uh, one might need to change the warrant depending on how that discussion goes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just note that two, two actions that the select board needs to take as noted on the agenda are the signing warrants of upcoming elections. Um, one of them is the April 9th annual town election and the other one is the 
uh, April 30th primary election for the Senate seat. And so there, there are not votes that are associated with that, but Select Board will be doing that uh, during this meeting or as soon as it's over. Um, <clears throat> Okay, let's see, so we still have five minutes, so I will do what we do sometimes when we do this, which is start at the end of the agenda and work our way backwards. So uh, the chair's report, um, I just note that uh, a couple of things that have happened lately that I do representing the select board and you should be aware of um, are that I was part of the forum, as many folks uh, here attended the forum at the chamber breakfast a couple of weeks ago about the Campus and Community Coalition and its work on behalf of uh, the town and the community to deal with uh, underage drinking and its continuing challenges. Um, I also was uh, part, I helped welcome the, there was a regional clerks uh, association meeting, uh, all the town clerks uh, in the Northeast uh, gathered at the Lord Jeff. They chose Amherst for, for this meeting and they gathered at the Lord Jeff last Thursday and Friday and uh, they get, they did a walking tour of, of Amherst and our historical sites, et cetera. Uh, and because Amherst was the host community, um, I got to welcome them and that was a nice occasion because uh, I was thinking about this, this gathering of town clerks and thinking, here's a group of people who really don't get nearly enough credit for what they do. These are the folks who in so many ways are the, the keepers of our democracy and the gateways of so much local participation from uh, whether it's getting on the ballot, whether it's registering to vote, whether it's arranging our elections, whether it's managing our laws after we've made changes to them, uh, our archives, our vital records. Uh, so it was, it was really, it was an honor to address those folks and it was so nice that they chose to come to Amherst. So uh, I hope that they enjoyed themselves here. Um, also, uh, the town manager and I were part of a meeting at UMass the other day with uh, Senator Rosenberg, Representative Story, the Chancellor, a number of folks from UMass uh, administration to talk about continuing challenges with neighborhood issues, the uh, uh, public safety issues that Mr. Kelly raised earlier, uh, and uh, the various ways we can just keep working to move all of this forward. Um, Mr. Kelly noted that, that efforts are being made on all of these fronts, uh, and that is absolutely the truth. Uh, the fire chief and police chief were there. We talked about um, about these kinds of stresses and challenges and, and what we can do both in the short term and the long term. So, uh, mm -hmm. so it might not always feel like progress is being made, but, but progress really is being made and, and certainly efforts are continuing constantly. The conversations are always happening. People are always looking for new ways to try and uh, address <coughs> these issues and solve these problems. So that was just another example of that. So I think that takes care of the chair's report, Ms. Stein. I just wanted to make a comment, if I could, about the ambulance. Sure. If I understood the story in the Gazette, the students that tied up the t ambulances, or the people who tied up the ambulances on Thursday were not UMass students. They were people who had gone to the concert um, and abused drugs or drink or both. Uh, that led to the ambulances, which I thought was just interesting. Didn't stop them from creating havoc on Saturday, but uh, nonetheless, I thought that was an interesting point that was in the article. Thank you, yes, for pointing that out. Um, it's true, it doesn't change the fact that this was basically a, a right. UMass Mullen Center sponsored event that, right. um, that brought this enormous uh, stress on our mm -hmm. public safety system that day. Um, but yes, it's nice to not, uh, Blame UMass students for everything, especially things that aren't actually their fault. Ms. Brewer. Uh, along those lines, and you probably have already discussed this as part of your ongoing discussion, but I was trying to reframe it in my mind, too, for the same reason that, you know, while it's not just students, I mean, it's people who are, you know, 18 to 26 who are this demographic who want to go to this concert. But what does another, bi what does a larger city, a more regional area that we don't, you know, we don't, we think of the Mellon Center as being part of UMass, but in some ways it's really more like an expo center or you know a fleet center or whatever those various things are. I don't go to many concerts. Um, but, and so how those communities deal with that given that it's not just a UMass audience. It's not just, oh, they're moving the students from one part of campus to another. We're bringing people in from all over. So can they up the ticket prices to help you know, deal with our ambulance, et cetera, while still accommodating UMass students, perhaps in a, you know, at a different level of things, just like Fine Arts Center events cost one thing for students and another thing for the general public. 
So um, I think that sometimes we forget that very thing, that it's a regional, trans it's a regional entertainment hub, not just a UMass moving kids from one place to another on campus. Thank you. Okay, uh, so if you don't mind, then we will move on to our 645 item, which is formalizing the appointments mo to the Mount Holyoke Range Advisory Committee, and we have uh, Ms. Campbell here to talk to us about this. Um, so like we'll, we'll recall that we dealt with this uh, a while back. Ms. Campbell had brought to our attention that this is a, a, a kind of a regional committee to which Amherst is allowed by this committee's uh, formation to members, and it had sort of fallen under the radar. So Ms. Campbell had been continuing to go and represent Amherst, which was wonderful, but she wanted a way to kind of formalize that to have other folks in town know that this opportunity is available and uh, and so she worked with the committee to come up with some descriptions for the the town that we could put on our website about the committee so that folks uh, who might be interested in serving would know about it so now I'll turn it over to you right we're a different kind of regional recreational and entertainment facility I think um, the there is a Mount Holyoke Range Advisory Committee it has, per, it has room for two people from each town that the Holyoke Range touches, Amherst, Belchertown, Granby, Hadley, South Hadley. And we're having a hard time in general getting members. I mean, we haven't had anybody from Belchertown for a long time, but I have been going for Amherst, I think that I was told it was since 2003, I'm not sure, it's been a long time, but we're entitled to two. And so it did seem like a good idea to formalize it. This committee evolved when John Olver was a state senator and they were trying to get the state park there. And so it's, it's got a long, noble history. I even suggested to him that now that he's retired, he could join, but I don't think he wants to. But he could apply. Anyway, the meetings are Thursdays at gen of, excuse me, third Thursdays of each month, usually in the spring and fall. We rarely meet in the winter, we occasionally meet in the summer. And they're usually at the Notch Visitor Center, although sometimes due to budget constraints or whatever, that building isn't open and that presents a problem. We don't have an office, we don't have any funds. Most of the people on the committee are older than me and relatively few of them use computers for anything, so one of the members has been sending out agendas to town clerks so they can be posted in honor of the open meeting law. We don't have a collection of minutes, although I'm going to try to get some, and I've been told they could be scanned here and put on the website, so there could be a collection of at least recent minutes. You know, it's basically a bunch of volunteers <laughs> with no, no real um, framework for doing any of tho those kinds of things. I also wanted to mention, while I'm here, it's coincidentally very timely that the state is developing a resource management plan for the Mount Holyoke Range planning unit, which includes not only the Mount Holyoke Range State Park, but also Mount Tom Reservation and the Holyoke Heritage Park in Holyoke and a couple of smaller things. And that plan is currently on their website ready for people to comment, and the deadline is March 24th. So I brought a whole bunch of little pieces of paper with the website on it, so maybe that could be put on the town's website to get, get people. Anyway, are there more questions about the committee? So Ms. Campbell su supplied, a, uh, it's not exactly a charge because it's not a right. town committee, so it's just a description of their work to put on the website so that folks who are looking for opportunities can know that this is among them. Um, so do folks have any questions about the details of that or the process of our handling this? Ms. Brewer. I think, um, I think that's a great way of approaching it because you know, we gotta fit it in some kind of box somewhere. <laughs> so um, one of the things that it just reminds us is that we have to work on the concept of type committee. Well, yeah, everything's a committee. But what we, try, we were trying to approach that with in a previous life was whether or not it was a time limited committee, like there are some things that we say you'll do this project and then you'll be done and others are ongoing, although I don't know if ongoing is necessarily a word we wanna use, but just committee is not really a great word. But a wanna be staff can come up with some 
brilliant plan on that because they're really the ones that in many cases help people sort out what are their various opportunities you know mm -hmm. and what's new and what's old and so we can come up with something like that and the same in terms of the length of appointment right. do you guys feel like you have a a time well you know to be honest given the relative lack of interest in all the towns and people being on it we've been happy to have people stay on as long as they're willing because you know, it it's not as if there seems to be much competition yeah i mean it's not a powerful committee or anything and in theory it gives advice to dcr but with the dcr budget situation such as it is you know we can advise till we turn blue but if there's no money to to do things so we try to be helpful and knowledgeable and informative and collegial about about it but I think we did have someone get on from another town who hoped to really change things and then found out the budget wasn't going to allow for much change. So, Ms. Burr. I wonder if, and you know, and again, referencing the fact that this is another type of committee that's not Amherst based, right. but we, you're not the only one like this. There are a couple of these very unusual things. We have the Hampshire Emergency regional whatever order those words are in that we also send people to that again we don't create the charge we just are allowed representatives but we want to make sure people know that the opportunity is available the only thing I'm I'm I guess I'm concerned about if we do the length of term is I wonder how that then plays out with the town clerk worrying about whether or not people have taken mm -hmm. the ethics training and how often they have to do that and mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. so I don't know about how some of those details play out now that we have so many more rules associated with those things which is probably why it's easier to just not put it on our website in the first place but I I prefer trying to fit it into this format as long as it doesn't have unforeseen consequences that cause other problems when the open meeting law was first going into effect the state did in, you know set up some open meeting law training things and encourage people from all kinds of things around here to go but whether that will continue you know into the future for new board members I don't know so uh, it, so I think all that we need to do is say yes okay this is a good way to proceed um, there this is as you said sort of a, a a different class of committee a different type of committee of which we have a couple of um, so m maybe you folks as our committee people could consider what a good option is for dealing with the other ones if you, if you want to try to make those more parallel to this one have a description of their work or whatever and, and whatever other kind of questions come up um, maybe talk with the town clerk about how she wants to deal with it maybe it's not her problem at all I have no idea not everything actually comes under the open meeting law so before you, this you could know, be tie yourself in knots this you, one does you, it does okay yeah. so there you go or at um, least we've been told it does by our town clerk who wants the wants the agenda at least 48 hours before <laughs> You know, wants to be able to post it. Or so, uh, so there are uh, some questions here. I think all that we need to do is say, okay, yes, yeah. this is a good way to, to start with Agreed. this one, and we can fine tune it as we go forward. So you guys will kind of work on that, think about it, and yeah, let us I'd know be happy if we to need have to do us anything. work with Deborah and, and Sandra on this. That'd be great. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a we have a motion here, but I'm not sure we actually need to vote on anything because it's not really an official town thing. We're just saying thank you, thank you for your service, and we hope that we can get other folks to right. join you. And thank you for doing this extra work. Miss. Okay, um, very good. So any other questions or comments on that or we're pretty clear on how we're gonna proceed? Very good, all right. So then our next item uh, is right now, a 655 is a uh, food truck regulations update. I'll note that Mr. Hayden has joined us. I wasn't sure what time you were gonna get here, so we tried to. <laughs> okay, um, food truck regulations. Mm -hmm. um, in your packets, you have a draft concept of some details of potential food truck regulations. They're not the regulations themselves, they're just the details uh, at mm -hmm. this point that, uh, that they might include. Uh, as the sort of uh, intro paragraphs in there that talk about uh, the process that you folks are all aware of, because I've been telling you about it in various meetings, that uh, Mr. Crow Grave from the bid and uh, Mr. Maroulis from the Chamber of Commerce and I have met several times to talk about these issues, to talk about the fact that there is kind of this new commercial sector um, and uh, business owners have some concerns about it. Um, we have had a fair amount of public comment just to the select board because this has been in the newspaper. Um, 
uh, about really a very strong public support for the food truck concept. So uh, Mr. Morales, Mr. Kograbi, and I tried to kind of bring all the concerns, all the, all the uh, sensibilities together on this and talk about, okay, what would be a way we might proceed with this? And one of the things that um, <laughs> we sort of determined is that the current situation, uh, while could well, it could benefit from some tweaks is really not a problem. And so we don't want to over-regulate what is a, a very small food truck uh, situation. But we do want to be ready for the future in case the, we get more and more growth uh, in this area. As Slack Word <coughs> well knows, we went from having zero taxi companies to having, um, you know, about 100 taxi companies in just a couple of years. And we, and we didn't really have a regulations and a process to keep up with that growth. So we didn't want to find ourselves behind uh, similarly with the food truck situation. So what you have there is, is a draft of the concepts. Um, I will uh, see if Mr. Krograbe would like to comment on this uh, in, in just a moment. But uh, the idea is basically for you to think about them, for you to see what you think, for you to talk to other people. Um, I will be circulating them to folks in town hall, regulatory folks who um, we would want to weigh in on this, the code enforcement folks, the park enforcement folks, people like that, um, uh, town council. Um, Mr. Marulis and Mr. Krograbe will be circulating them to the business community. I will make sure that the current food truck licensees, of which we have two trucks and one cart, uh, receive them also. Uh, and hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we would get enough public comment that we would be ready to have, dra uh, have more formal regulatory language approved in the middle of March. If that's too soon, then it would be early April, as, uh, just as soon as is reasonable. Um, so what I would like to do is have this on the agenda again next week, which would be a time for a select board to have thought about it in the meantime, um, and if people want to comment at that time. But uh, uh, basically, that's kind of where we are. Um, I, I can summarize the, that the issues are basically where you would want to put the food trucks so that they minimize the concerns uh, it, that it are raised for businesses and also really promote the best kind of vitality downtown. Um, so we looked at putting them uh, in kind of green spaces and places that we're looking to have more activity. And that is by the Kendrick Park, the Common, and Sweetser Park, um, with a couple of other sidewalk areas uh, that could be available for smaller uh, uh, on-sidewalk food cart type um, things. Um, one of the things that I learned through this process is, as Select Board knows, we were basically starting with nothing. We had we had no ability to kind of regulate or fine tune this. We didn't have any metric to use for, f or uh, you know, kind of framework for determining any kind of regulations for for folks. So. Uh, this experience taught me that there's a lot more we can be asking about when we get such license applications so that we can be determining more specifically what good spots are for folks. So um, I think I'll stop talking now, see if Mr. Krograbe wants to offer any comment, and then see if Select Board has questions about this. Welcome. Hi, Alex Krograbe from the Amherst Business Improvement District. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I think Ms. O'Keefe did an excellent job summarizing the discussions that she and Mr. Morales and I had, um, both in this document and in that brief summary just then. Um, Tony and I have received a, a variety of feedback on this issue, um, and it's, <coughs> it's complicated trying to balance all the different uh, uh, perspectives, but I think this uh, th there's some good draft um, ideas. So um, I'm just voicing <coughs> my support for what you have before you. Thank you very much. And it, it's really been very productive conversations uh, about this, um, really recognizing that, that there are a lot of interests here, and it's the, it's the interest of the downtown kind of vitality in general. It's the interest of, uh, of the public who is uh, support of this, uh, supportive of this, and of course it is the interest of the downtown business community who you know, are kind of, uh, of, of varying minds about this. So to try and take a responsible approach, we think is, and a planful approach is the way to proceed. So any thoughts off the top of your head, Ms. Brewer? Some specific things, and she said you'll be circulating this, if I, and it's really just some tweaking of specific questions, particularly within our enforcement people, because I know one of the things we talked about as a select board before when we, were, we started to see these is, okay, well, we can put the hours down, but who's going to go check on that? 
And you know, who is it that enforces that? We don't want to assume somebody's enforcing it and it's not and it's unfair or perceived as unfair. So that will be good to get that feedback from our enforcement people. Who, who, where do they think the responsibilities for various pieces of this lie? Um, I don't know if ours would be separate from location on sidewalk, for example, or if um, the question about uh, the use of restrooms by the actual vendor as opposed to the customers, you know, just find your restroom, but um, what, what's the vendor supposed to do, as was brought up um, in a particular email that we received today and that will be end added to our packet. I would think the health director would have something to say about that. I mean, just like there has to be a place for the vendor to wash their hands, there must be be a place they're supposed to be using a restroom but I don't know what that place is and do does that then fall into this as well or do we say that's over in her purview and we're sure it's being taken care of I that's where I just need to understand better where the lines are <coughs> and um, associated with that the parking discussion of course that we'll be having anyway is like the big broad parking discussion about all kinds of detailed things and so I guess the timing's pretty good from that standpoint because we've been wondering about that too. Do we let people feed meters? Is it like a book buyback? You know, what's this like? So I think that will be helpful. And, and just in terms of understanding, you know, we have these taxi regulations right now, but again, they're not a bylaw in the same way that we have bylaws about some things because we used to write bylaws more about stuff in the old days, and maybe other towns have ordinances because they're cities. Um, but I just, I need a better understanding of where this fits. And so if it's like our taxi regs, which seems like maybe that's kind of the, the <coughs> format that we're looking for, it's not something that we're going to town meeting with, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that's enforceable. And that isn't some, I mean, and obviously is subject to much public comment and, and future revision. But I'm wondering if there's any legal difference between us making these regulations and saying, okay, so and so will go enforce the hours and so and so will go check on the bathrooms or whatever, versus if you have a town bylaw that says X, Y, or Z, that's somehow better for some reason. I would think that regulations would be more nimble, but I, I just don't know. Okay. Other questions or comments? Thoughts about food regs, uh, Ms. Stein. I just want to say that um, Ms. Brewer is right. The Board of Health does have a role. Um, it's up to them to make sure that the temperature of food outside is appropriate, and um, particularly for raw food, that could spoil quickly. So I know that this has come up um, in terms of uh, the farmers markets both on the Wednesday market during the summer and in the Spring Street lot uh, for foods that were are sold and the um, just to be clear uh, all food truck vendors do have to have a permit through the right. health department and it does deal with exactly those things and a bunch of other things including uh, according to the permit thing you've got to attach a list of the bathroom facilities that you have some that's agreement to use or whatever but that I, I and but I'll get more information about that um, my assumption is that that is related to the the um, vendor the the food truck person not their customer base and so uh, the which I think the email we got today was alluding in partially to the customer base but uh, if there are problems with enforcement it, it, you want to be clear whose whose yes. jurisdiction that's under so yes absolutely we'll get that clarified other questions or comments mr. Hayden I, I, I'm going to uh, request more time to, to, to consider this, but that just a couple of notes that I would make as I think about it. One is that um, uh, how it relates to our job as minders of the public way, well, that's, that's obvious. So clearly there's a number of regulations that, um, are, that we're likely to need to, to, to implement. Parking, you know, uh, not molesting traffic, uh, pedestrian or, or automobile and otherwise. Um, so I'm kind of thinking maybe that's the right way to go. But also um, when, the, um, when the rules are promulgated, I think we may also need to note the planning um, issues that might come up with this. Okay, you can't park them on the street overnight. I think that's obvious. Can you park them at your house? Is it an accessory use? Um, and, and not so much to um, form a regulation or bylaw on it as to have an opinion. Um, as to how that would be considered. Okay. And there, there's signs and other things that kind of pull in too, but that's all. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Mr. Well. <clears throat> Sorry, just a minor one. So I noticed in the, in the case of the recommendations for the current, you know, one says no concerns and one suggests a change of location. 
and the other one is basically telling the vendor to enforce other people's policies. Uh, you know, don't let people, don't tell your people not to park in the street and so forth. Is that, is there a better solution than that? If you can think of one, we'd be happy to hear it. <laughs> I can't. So, so that's related specifically to um, to one of the vendors who's on the sidewalk right, right now, and there have been issues with customers using the outdoor seating mm -hmm. uh, at uh, at Bart's and uh, apparently also the bathrooms and stuff. So, um, oh, and also the, the cars on the street, right, as I mentioned, kind of live parking and whatever, yeah. right? Um, I don't know that that's the vendor's responsibility to enforce it, but it, it, that person could certainly have a role in helping to discourage it. And so okay. if we could get some signage uh -huh. or we could make uh, that vendor aware that to kind of spread the message, you know, mm -hmm. please don't be using these tables and, you know, you absolutely can't be served from behind the truck and right. if you're parking there or whatever. <laughs> um, so just kind of more education and communication on it. Mm -hmm. Certainly if you have other ideas. No, I just <laughs> wondered why there wasn't a change of location suggested if that location is yeah. so problematic. Yeah. <coughs> Just asking. Yeah, no, so we don't have one, but it could be suggested for sure. Okay, other questions or comments about this issue now? Ms. Brewer? I just was gonna recommend to the public that if they haven't already looked at the map, and you know, look, I looked at the map a couple of different times to tell myself whether or not this made sense to me, and I think it looks really good. Obviously, you guys spent a lot of time thinking about this, and so people should think about and drive past those places and see what makes sense to them. I mean, obviously, to some extent, the business is seasonal. And so we're not expecting, it's like at this time of year, I'm thinking, who's gonna be down by Kendrick Park? But as soon as the weather turns nice, so mm -hmm. it makes sense. Okay, yeah, so um, so those uh, materials in draft form are all in the web packet for the select board meeting. Um, they will be again in the web packet for next week's meeting. Uh, we'll see if folks have more comment and see if anyone attends to, to give comment and we'll sort of have kind of try to take the pulse of where we are with it at that point to see if, uh, if we need more formal and extensive ways of collecting comment about this or, or whether we're kind of good to proceed. So till next week, thank you. Um, and also I'll note in the meantime, if folks read these documents uh, from the select board packet, by all means send comment. You know, they can, they can email the select board address with any comments about that in the meantime. So good, thank you, Ms. Brewer. I'm sorry, so you're, uh, you're planning to circulate what we have now within town hall, like yes. now mm -hmm. before our next meeting, excellent. Okay, moving on. 705 item, FY14 budget discussion, town manager's budget recommendations. Um, we are supposed to be emailing questions to the town manager ahead of time. Uh, I don't know if we've, any of us have done that or not. Anyone have emailed questions to Mr. Resanti? <coughs> That looks like a no. Yeah, okay. <laughs> are there any other kind of general questions or comments that we either want to prepare him for for next time or uh, or just want to discuss right now, Mr. Heaton? Not, not, a, not something to prepare him for next time, but um, as I've been going through it, uh, my questions I hope aren't a package making their way from the West Coast to me now. But um, the, um, I, I want to appreciate again um, the quality of the mission statements, the, um, the little synopsis is about the big changes that we're looking at this year, um, and the little <coughs> bullet descriptions about um, you know, goals and challenges. Um, that's all very helpful. And in fact, most of my questions I'm finding are ending up there. Uh, I just want to be appreciative for that. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just throw in appreciation for the org charts, which I think really are a yes, good way right, right. Of, of illustrating to folks um, just what's going on in each department and, and who's doing it. It really kind of makes more concrete a lot of the, um, the, the written summary that you're talking about. Ms. Brewer. In, in terms of just a more of a global question, this sort of thing tends to come up through our BCG meetings or our JCPC meetings perhaps, but I certainly at this point have no intention of going to finance committee meetings or reading their minutes. So if they run into something that they find questionable, I'd love for us to know about it too, just so, you know, even if it's just, oh, they had this question, this was the answer, just so that we're all kind of on the same page without having to go to more meetings. That would be really great. Mr. Bicente, are you aware of any issues that have come up uh, of, of substance that, that you're concerned about and need to deal with through Finance Committee or other venues? Uh, no, but I will uh, give that helpful reminder to Sandy, who's been very good about alerting to any subject matter, if not issues, uh, that, that come up uh, with, with FinCom, but happy to do that. 
um, and I'll note this gets a little bit into the town manager's report, but um, um, Mr. Hayden had suggested early on that we have a discussion um, as part of the budget discussion about the paving plan for next year. Yeah. So we're going to do that at next week's meeting as part of our talking about um, parking and various street related issues so um because the dpw budget involves you know paving and recommendations we've had all kinds of um, comment from um from members of the public about how those things might proceed there's going to be a big discussion about that with mr mooring uh next week so uh, and so if folks have other issues that they would like to kind of delve into more detail on like that let me know when we can get that scheduled all right anything else about the budget that we want to discuss now Okay, then we have a couple minutes before the town manager's report, and I don't like to start things early. So let's um, let's note a, a untimed item: the select board meeting date schedule. Now that Mr. Hayden is here, we can talk about this. Um, two things: one is because of the way the holidays fall this year, we have a really big gap between meetings in. Uh, mid-March to mid-April so it is going to be very difficult to fit in all of our warrant article stuff in <clears throat> those three meetings in April so I'm wondering if the select board would be interested in breaking with its usual tradition of not meeting the night before the annual town election we never do that um, and the, the reasoning behind that is it's kind of awkward, especially you know if people are busy campaigning and you've got all these things going, but we have another year of uncontested select board elections, so there's not a really big risk of Ms. Brewer and Mr. Wald uh, losing their reelection bid, but of course you never know. Um, but I'm throwing that out there as something for us to consider whether we would be willing to add that date, and if so, that would mean we could get rid of the Friday April 5th morning meeting when we would otherwise have a quickie meeting just to sign the warrant because we need to sign the warrant four weeks before town meeting begins. Um, so I want to throw that out there and see what folks think of that and I'll just throw out the other concept now also which is we always meet the Wednesday of the, um, the school vacation week there that starts with um, Patriots Day. Um, in the middle of April, we always meet at the police station on Wednesday. Last year, suddenly it occurred to me, how come we don't maybe meet Tuesday, in which case we could meet here, because that way the meeting could be broadcast live, as opposed to its only rebroadcast when we meet at the police station. So there might well be scheduling reasons that prevent us from doing that, but uh, so I'm proposing meeting Monday, April 8th, as opposed to not meeting that week, and instead of meeting Wednesday, the 17th of April, meeting Tuesday, the 16th thoughts about these miss Burr. I want to go you one better I want to not meet the fifth which was already part of this I want to go ahead and meet on the eighth because according to our friends at the newspapers there are no contested elections townwide I I'm not entirely comfortable with doing it select board only but um, if since there appear to be no contested elections townwide is the current update. Um, I'm more comfortable with going with the 8th, but I don't want to meet on the 17th. Yes, there's no school committee race. That's oh. right. So <laughs> Wednesday the 17th, I would actually rather not meet. I always find that week incredibly awkward with being break week. And if we're meeting the 8th, then I'm not sure. We weren't actually going to do anything on the 5th except sign the warrant, right? So I'm not clear why we need the 17th if we can have a real meeting on the 8th. Because typically we would have more meetings than that prior to town meeting. So uh, we often start dealing with warrant articles the meeting before we sign the warrant. But the meeting before we sign the warrant is um, this time March 18th, I think. Is that the right date? Um, which is so far before we sign the warrant that it might not be possible to do any warrant articles at that time. Um, the following week is the beginning of Passover, and the week after that is the end of Passover. So we're really just, uh, our, our schedule is much more challenged this time than usual for that time of year when we really need to fit in a lot of stuff. What if we, what if we 
try not to meet the 17th, soon enough we'll know, we'll have a much better idea what the warrant looks like. And if it looks like we can fit things into if other select board members are able to meet that night of the 8th and then the other two meetings in April, then that could work. Um, and we could hold the 17th as a maybe once we have a better picture. How does that? Which, which could be the 16th, and which would be fine. I, I, I appreciated what you said earlier. It, it confuses people when we're in the <coughs> police station. It confuses us. <laughs> it's nice to have the live <laughs> broadcast if we could have it in here on the 16th. So I'm perfectly fine with moving to the 16th, but I would love to have it be a only if needed okay. based on, and, and probably we will because that's just the nature of town meeting articles. But. If there's a way that we can avoid it, so much the better. But okay. definitely meeting on the 8th. Okay. Hi, other people, concerns about meeting on the 8th? Inability to meet on the 8th? Okay. Um, and so meeting on the 16th rather than the 17th and only if necessary? Everyone can do that? Okay. Good. Then we'll see how that goes. Okay. So we will meet the 8th. We will not meet the 5th. And we will hold the 16th. We'll cancel the 17th. Forget that. We'll, um, we'll hold the 16th as a maybe meeting. Thank you. Okay. Other schedule issues, Mr. Eden? Yeah, just, just before we go on, I, I, I want to, to say again um, that um, in, in accepting the, the, the concept of meeting on Monday before election, it's very important that we're not taking that sort of as a flip easy thing, that there really is not other business going on that night that might be better attended to than having us gather. Right, and so um, uh, it, that this has been this has been the select board's practice for a while, and so I think that we are making an exception. Right. Yeah, it, we're making an exception due to necessity. Um, so, but, but if people aren't comfortable with that, then we don't need to do it. I just wanted to put that out there as a possibility. Okay, um, so because we do vote on our schedule, we might as well vote on that. So um, if, I'm not sure if we have a motion, I think I'll just, we do? Well, you, you just made it. Me <laughs> so so, uh, so I, uh, how about I move that we cancel the scheduled meetings on April 5th and April 17th, and instead meet Monday, April 8th, and Tuesday, April 16th, if necessary. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Next we have town manager's report. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, very brief update, Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods Working Group. Uh, they are a working group, uh, all 18 of them, <coughs> meeting regularly, weekly at this point, uh, including a doubleheader on March 5th, which will be an afternoon business meeting and an evening uh, public forum number two. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of progress has been made and we're getting into the home stretch uh, for the work group to develop specific recommendations to me on uh, uh, related to uh, best practices and potential bylaw uh, changes related to rental properties in town. Um, so there's another meeting scheduled for tomorrow, uh, the 26th from 3 to 5 p.m. in this room. Uh, and it's really uh, this kind of iterative process with the committee and staff on draft regulations. There's a focus on uh, registration uh, requirements th themselves, uh, parking plans, site management plans, et cetera, contacts, uh, development of a complaint-based system. Um, lots of good questions being asked throughout the process, including questions that uh, require uh, some feedback from town council, which is uh, happening in a, a fairly substantial way, and that tomorrow's meeting will be another opportunity for the group to hear some of that feedback. Uh, and then on the following week, the 5th. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it, it looks promising for the group to try to be really focusing on 
finalizing some recommendations, if not the 5th itself, but uh, the following Tuesday, the 12th. Questions or comments about safe and healthy <coughs> neighborhoods? I would just note that all of our packet materials are online. Um, uh, if you go to the living tab on the town website and choose safe and healthy and then scroll down, uh, you'll find it. Um, it, that always has kind of the draft regulations in the current form, uh, lots of interesting packet materials. So far, we've been talking mostly about <coughs> what it would take to comply. Tomorrow is sure to be an interesting discussion when we talk about what the penalties would be for non-compliance. This is when things get really interesting. So, uh, so that's tomorrow's meeting, uh, and uh, stay tuned. And you know, my objective throughout this that's been articulated uh, uh, in the charge to the group and then fleshed out in much more detail uh, in a very constructive way by the group is coming up with uh, recommendations that make a difference, that are meaningful, that affect uh, the, uh, the quality of the uh, rental experience at Amherst, which is a fundamental part of our local housing stock and our local economy. And uh, having some good, uh, candid discussions about how that can work better than it does uh, presently. Um, so moving on from that, uh, parking update, a uh, couple quick things. Uh, uh, just a, re a reminder, next week, March 4th, uh, we have a public hearing scheduled to consider select board consideration of parking regulations updates. I've talked about those at some previous meetings, uh, things related to loading zones, taxi stands, uh, uh, metered and permit parking on, on uh, uh, Spring Street, uh, Boltwood Garage, reserve spaces, uh, things like that. So uh, there'll be a series of specific recommendations uh, in your packet uh, for your consideration uh, next Monday night. Uh, next, uh, you should have on your desk an update of a, of a parking system issues worksheet that you've seen before uh, with our rollout uh, in 2011 of uh, our new parking machines, multi-space meter machines in the parking lots. Uh, we've had a number of issues uh, related to their uh, implementation and effectiveness, the vast majority of which have been addressed, but there are a handful of, of important ones that remain that I wanted to give you a status on, and they're really summarized in items B through G of our alphabetized list of issues. Um, related to uh, the speed of the machine when you have a transaction to be processed, uh, particularly when using a credit card, uh, lighting issues, uh, and just basic signage and, and uh, instruction issues. So starting with B, uh, B and uh, G, uh, this response time issue, which is really a uh, relation to the uh, software installed in these machines uh, from the company Duncan Solutions. It's a 2G uh, network. Uh, we are uh, very aggressively working with Duncan to become their first client to have a 3G network installed in each of these machines. Uh, we have a commitment from Duncan that that will be done uh, no later than uh, May for all 11 of our machines. Uh, that will, we believe, and I hope I'm being conservatively uh, slow on this <laughs> in terms of the uh, performance uh, speed, we think that will reduce the transaction processing time uh, by more than half, possibly substantially more than half. Uh, and so, you make a transaction or you think you've entered a transaction into the machine, you're not seeing anything happen uh, in a, uh, you know, what you consider to be a reasonable amount of time. So you think there's something wrong with the machine, you start pushing all the buttons and, uh, you know, worse things happen when, when, that, when that occurs. So we think this 2G to 3G uh, issue will uh, substantially improve that and uh, eliminate or at least reduce those issues. It will also help the communication between machines where you're trying to figure out the status of your parking time remaining, et cetera, at a particular numbered space and you want to do it at a different machine. 
their ability to communicate with each other should should be improved. Uh, the next issue is related to lighting. Um, um, not an issue that has been a big issue in other installations in other communities, um, but we don't have, uh, and I'm not suggesting we change that in any major way, uh, macro way. Uh, some of our lots are not as well lit uh, as some lots you might find in a more urban uh, environment. What we have come up with is a lighting solution that involves the installation of a light pole uh, at eight of our machines in the Town Hall, Boltwood, uh, the CVS Town portion lot, and uh, the Spring Street parking lots. Uh, that should be installed uh, no later than May. Uh, we have three machines in the Main Street lot in front of Town Hall and the uh, Amity Street lot uh, that do not have electri electrical power to the base of the unit there. Uh, we're looking at solar uh, powered lights for those three locations pending a, a longer term solution that may pr bring elect electrical power to those spaces if and when we do future parking, uh, parking uh, lot upgrades there. Um, and then we have other monies in our capital budget, uh, item E here, uh, directional signage, uh, banners, et cetera. There is money set aside for that purpose. Uh, there's been a detailed plan, uh, and those should be installed by May as well. Um, the, uh, we'll also have a more uh, visible and legible uh, in set of instruction signs, the same set of instructions that you see on the meter on the machine itself about what the uh, steps are to uh, complete a transaction. It will have a freestanding sign uh, no later than April 1st at, at the machines as well, uh, adjacent to where these lights are going to go. So you'll have something a more, pro more a larger sign at eye level that just says the basic steps one, two, three, four. Uh, to do that, so that'll be in. So we think the combination of those things addresses the uh, remaining issues. Questions or comments, Ms. Brewer? Have the signs under, I guess that would be F, have they been ordered yet in terms of the wording? Because if they haven't, I think we should see them, simply because we, we keep kind of having the same problem and maybe a fresh set of eyes would help. Not that we don't have experts who know how to do these things, but one of the things, for example, that I found helpful when I help somebody in a lot, which I think all of us has done recently, <laughs> oh, here's how you use the machine, is that they aren't perceiving it the same way they do with a meter where you always check first to see if there's money in your meter, right, before you start sticking coins in it. Well, they don't, people don't think that way about these machines. They're so worried about getting money into it that it gets confused. So I just wonder if we could take another quick look at those before they go out. I'm, I'm happy to send you, we have the template, uh, happy to- If it hasn't been printed sh yet. Show you, we were gonna, you know, have the signs made uh, immediately after next Monday's okay. finalization of the regulations in case any of the wording we might wanna use would be changed. Okay, as great, a result so it'll be in our packet. Uh, it could be. Could be. If you're, could be uh, now. You so desire to look at that would what be the awesome. sign might look like. Actually, could you send it to us by email ahead of time yeah. so we can go out in the parking lot? And um, because I ran into this yeah. just this past no, weekend with someone, and I would like to be sure that it's um, extraordinarily clear. I won't say idiot proof, but that's what I have in mind. <laughs> <laughs> we keep trying. All right. And you, okay. you feel pretty confident that um, that the lighting can get in by May? Yes. Because uh, that was something we talked about a year ago, and then in the fall we were saying, you know, try and, if there's a way to prioritize that so that it can be in before the it was getting dark so much earlier as things turned to fall and winter. The original pursuit was lighting somehow housed in the, in the machine itself, but that has proven not to be doable. <coughs> Other questions and comments about the parking machines? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, next, I wanted to quickly summarize, uh, we are in receipt of a couple of grants 
from the Community Innovation Challenge Grant Program. Uh, Governor Patrick and Lieutenant Governor Murray, uh, they announced uh, the week before last uh, there were 27 grants distributed statewide. Amherst is involved with two of them. Uh, one is uh, related to the regionalization of assessing services. Uh, 35,000 was awarded uh, uh, to the town of Amherst. We are, as you know, uh, uh, providing uh, property assessment services to our neighbors in Pelham through an intermunicipal agreement that you've previously approved and the state grant um, funds uh, primarily some of the hardware software to uh, uh, provide Pelham with that level of service and not have it be a, a financial hit uh, on the town of Amherst. There'll be some equipment and uh, residents of Pelham will also have access to our online uh, database just as Amherst residents do to look up parcel specific information. Um, also, uh, veteran services, uh, we've had a, uh, w a very successful uh, uh, veteran services district uh, that uh, uh, we've been a member of now for a number of years, working primarily with the city of Northampton, but a number of the other area communities. We've been awarded a $35,083. Uh, sounds like a Steve Connor proposal. That last $83 was critical. Uh, uh, this is an expansion of this effort. Uh, the towns of Hadley and Middlefield are joining our Veteran Services District. And so this provides uh, high quality uh, support for veterans, surviving spouses, et cetera, along with referrals to uh, uh, local, federal, and state agencies. And this allows that expansion to, to uh, to occur and makes it uh, easier for the member communities to take that on uh, and reduce the out-of-pocket. So that's been a real success story and this is an, uh, an expansion of that effort. Um, let's see, next. Uh, um, ne also as a preview of next week's select board meeting, you'll be, we've scheduled uh, uh, we're going to the bond market as a town, selling bonds for a number of capital projects previously approved. And this past week, we've uh, had our bond rating uh, reaffirmed at our AA long-term rating with a stable outlook uh, from Standard & Poor's. We're very, very pleased uh, to have that rating reaffirmed, again, citing our strong and stable economic base, including the fact that our local economy is anchored uh, with uh, higher ed institutions, including UMass, Amherst, Hampshire College, uh, good income and wealth uh, indicators, good financial management, good reserves, low overall debt uh, burden. They noted our progress on funding some of our longer term unfunded liabilities, such as uh, other post-employment uh, benefit costs. And they note the progress we're making, but they note that it's a big liability, which uh, is not news to us, but uh, uh, so they note the progress uh, that hasn't triggered uh, along with other issues uh, an upgrade, but we're very, very pleased with uh, having our double A uh, with a stable outlook reaffirmed. Um, next, uh, just as a follow-up item to uh, uh, I believe your February 11th meeting. Um, there was a question that night about uh, legal uh, legal opinion related to uh, filling vacancies on elected boards and a uh, question about uh, the applicability of state law, chapter 41, section 11. And what does the word shall mean in yes. the statutory sense as opposed to Webster's Dictionary? Right. Um, and we did pursue uh, additional feedback from uh, town council. And the basic feedback was that uh, it's town council's opinion uh, that um, select board 
um, is not obligated to make an appointment to fill the vacancy or to call a special election. You do have some discretion uh, in that judgment call, despite the use of the word sell, shall, and uh, that uh, the word shall is in this statute is, is uh, not considered, uh, uh, is, it's considered uh, directory as opposed to mandatory. And so there's a whole longer treatise on that that uh, went back and forth, but uh, we did get some feedback and affirmed the approach that was taken in that regard. Ms. Brewer? Quickly on that item, <coughs> my intention, we shall see if my intentions come <laughs> true, but my intention is to take what Ms. O'Keefe has so kindly written down for us in the past and just add a couple of sentences based on sure. that particular yep. thing, just so it's more crystal clear for everyone, not only on our board, but on others to follow for, again, you know, picking apart that one particular sentence that said, but if the library trustees ask you to do it, it's like, no, still, we don't have to do it. And also, removing the concept of special election from the discussion at all, because that was never an issue. And so, we, sure. we're not okay. talking about that. Okay, awesome. Very good. Other questions or comments for any Ms. Musanti's issues? <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, for the information about the uh, grants and for the staff applying for the grants. That's, sure. that's, a, yeah. that's a great way to augment <laughs> town funding uh, for things, and it's a great recognition by the state of what innovative programs those are and, and that it's a kind of a seal of approval to have those be worthy of, of grant support from the state. So, uh, so that's tremendous. Congratulations and thank you. Also, congratulations on the bond rating. Um, we kind of take for granted how well managed we are financially, but we certainly should not. <laughs> um, and so going to the bond market is the opportunity to, to get that reaffirmed because they are pretty thorough in their investigation <coughs> of the practices and, and the um, financial management. So that is also j just a kind of a marker of uh, good management of the town. They are good, and that report is just out, so we'll get that to you, and we'll get that posted up onto the website. Great. Thank you. It's a good independent, third-party critique of how we're doing. Right. So it's, it's welcome. <coughs> Thank you. So folks, we all remember what it's like for these bond things. We have to sign about 800 pieces of paper next week. Uh, so <laughs> get ready. OK, anything else? Uh, no, you mentioned our meeting with the chancellor last Friday. And, and uh, so I don't have anything to add to that. It was a good, good uh, discussion. Again, the focus is on actions that we can take co working collaboratively to uh, make things better. There's a lot of good things happening. There's more we can do. Questions or comments? All right, moving along. Um, okay, our 7.30 item, which we're a little bit late for, is a request for the select board to place mm -hmm. question on the April 9th ballot regarding flags, flying flags on September 11th. We have Mr. Kelly here to speak to us about this. I just a note about the scheduling of this. Typically, we do all things like this, like prior to the town manager's report, and then we get into town manager's report, members' reports, and stuff come at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty thin agenda for this week, and I knew that Mr. Hayden was going to be late, so I was trying to, uh, I was trying to put it at a place where we could guarantee that the whole select board would be present. So that's that. Mr. Kelly, take it away. Oh, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the select board for putting this on the agenda. I was a little surprised when I emailed the town clerk on Thursday morning, I think, and she said that if you approve of this, it takes 35 days for it to, to the lead time to get it on the uh, ballot. So that puts us around a March 4th deadline, I believe. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Second of all, I would just remind the, the folks at home or underscore for the folks <coughs> listening in tonight, watching tonight, that we're not talking like we've been talking for the last 12 years about whether the pros and cons of flying the 29 commemorative flags annually on 9-11 um, as opposed to the once every five year plan that's currently in place. What we're talking about here tonight is the select board by a majority of vote can put it on the ballot take the pulse of the people, so to speak, as a non-binding advisory question as to whether the flags should fly annually. And I, t as far as I'm concerned, you don't get any more pure democracy than one person, one vote. And to me, if I had to choose what the flag represents, I think all of us can agree. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to decide between my First Amendment rights and the rights of the people to vote 
um, to me it's, it's a toss up, but essentially I think we all agree that, that one of the things the flag represents is the, the right to vote, and that's what separates us from, God forbid, say North Korea or something like that. Um, so I don't understand if you don't and you haven't voted for the flags over the, the past few years, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to have this go before the people because they could reaffirm you and then you're, you're all set because as I said, five months ago on the night of September 10th, 2012, when I came here and asked last shot to get them up for this past 9-11, I said to you that if you put it on the ballot, I will live with that. And I'm, I'm saying it again here tonight. Um, just a very brief history, I'm gonna ramble a tiny bit, but in the year 2000, I came before that select board during the 615 question period, and I said to them, you can put a, any question on the ballot this spring, why don't you put the question, change our form of government on there? Take a, take a poll of the people and see if they're considering getting rid of town meeting. And strangely enough, they did, they listened to me. And strangely enough, it passed, not by a lot, just barely passed. But that was the year 2000. And then as you know, we had this whole charter committee was formed, very acrimonious in 2003. I think we had a 30% turnout for a local election, which is really good and it lost by 14 votes. Came back in 2005, we once again had a 30% turnout, it lost by a little more, 200 votes, but that's still 1%. So yes, we had this town meeting vote two years later on the flag issue, but who was spearheading that? Who was the architect of that? Who was standing up in front of town meeting in 2007? Larry Kelly. Who was the one who was out there leading the charge about trying to terminate town meeting and change our form of government to mayor council in 2003, 2005? Larry Kelly. So I have a feeling that that town meeting vote in 2007, astonishingly two thirds against flying the flags annually, that too was an advisory vote, as you well know, the town meeting doesn't have the rule over it. They, my resolution that night was please advise the select board to allow the flags to fly every annually on 9-11 and that lost by a two-thirds vote. But again, I'm here to tell you that I think some of that was residual, let us say, leftover bad feelings from me trying to terminate town meeting for a couple of years. And that really was the issue of the decade from 2000 to 2005 or whatever. So again, all I'm asking for you tonight is you know, town meeting, yes, it's, it's democracy, it's all of that, but it's superseded by one person, one vote. And as you know, town meeting can pass overrides, but it still has to be approved by the people. And I, you know, I haven't checked exactly, but off the top of my head, about half the overrides that have been approved by town meeting have been disapproved by the voters at the ballot box. So again, all I'm asking for you is to let the people decide. You know, what is wrong with that? It won't cost any more money, it won't cost any more time, and in a historical Catholic sort of sense, it allows you to wash your hands of this issue. And again, I reaffirm tonight that whatever the vote is on April, what is it, the 9th, I will abide by. I'll stop coming before you. Thank you very much. So uh, Mass General Law Chapter 53, Section 18A gives three paths to the ballot for non-binding referendum. Uh, one of them is the citizen route, one of them is the select board route, and one of them is the town meeting route. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, we had another citizen request to put something on the ballot. Uh, at this time, it was our last meeting in February also. At that time, it was a citizen request to put on a non-binding referendum about the Citizens United question. And that raised all kinds of issues for us. And we said, okay, you know what, the select board, um, doesn't have a practice of putting stuff on the uh, on a ballot to, to take the pulse of it, um, and it would certainly be peculiar for the select board to put on the ballot something that we weren't personally championing. The uh, Mass General Law already outlines a process for doing that, so I just want to remind us of that history. Uh, our own history with us with a similar question uh, a year ago and the other options. Um, before I get comment and question from the select board, um, Mr. Kelly, could you tell us why you didn't go ahead and put this on yourself? On what? On the ballot. 
because this, this, oh, there is a said, citizen path. Oh, as I said, it just occurred to me on Thursday, and that's when I emailed. I, I have no idea what the process is. Involves a lot of signatures. I, I would imagine much, it does, uh, yeah, much absolutely. time so. in advance. Okay, so I'll open it up to select board for comments. Ms. Brewer. Uh, not not having the heart to uh, go back and review what I said during the Citizens United discussion, but thank you for bringing that up because I am not big on advisory questions on ballots. I have a, a general bias, if anything, against them. I was extremely disappointed in a prior select board that put on an advisory question associated with an override than an actual override question, for example. I like votes to be meaningful. Um, Keeping that in mind, that particular type of question with that override, and also the Citizens United, I think that I can, in my mind, argue that this has been enough of a polarizing issue within our community, and it is something that's under the select board's purview to decide that having this information provided to us on the ballot is not a bad thing. Um, it's not, it's, I feel like I can separate it as being a different thing than, are you thinking about an override? Should we consider putting an override before people? Um, it's certainly broader than a town meeting vote in terms of potential participation. And I just feel like we've been dealing with this long enough in the press, outside the press, that even were the vote to go away that a particular seated select board didn't like, they would not be bound by it, but I think that they could use it as another piece of information in their decision making. Just as we at one point had a three, every three year plan, <coughs> then we went to an every five year plan, things can change. Future select boards may decide something else, but just as we have referred to the town meeting vote as being a piece of information in the discussion, I don't have a problem with us putting this on the ballot as an advisory question for the select board. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein. I am very happy with the policy the select board came up with, and I really did not or am not happy about the idea about putting it on the ballot. I think if Mr. Kelly wants it on the ballot, he should have gone the route of getting the citizen's petition to put it on the ballot. I don't think it has to fall on our shoulders to make that decision. So that's my take on it. On this side, Mr. Hayden. I agree with uh, Ms. Stein for, for so many reasons um, that I'm not going to go back over. I, I'm just inclined to, um, to put um, this on the ballot. Um, but I would also like to point out that words count, the words that you offer us when you, you speak to us. And if we were to put this on the ballot, then you'd have to waive your First Amendment right to come here and never speak with us again. And I'm, I'm just not comfortable with that. So among a lot of the other words that have been spoken. What would be about that issue, Aaron? <laughs> like I say, the words count. Mr. Wong. Uh, uh, somewhat mixed feelings about this because I understand the policy concerns. I'm trying to recall, I didn't, unfortunately, didn't recheck my notes, but as I recall, when Mr. Kelly came before us last fall, uh, there was some other public comment, including that of Mr. Winslow, who was the chair of the Human Rights Commission at the time. And I recall him saying that there are a few graver violations of human rights than the mass murder of civilians, and that he thought this would be appropriate to bring to the town in some form or fashion. So I guess the question I have is what form or fashion that should be, whether a town meeting vote or a general vote, number one, and then number two, by what means we get there. That is, whether it's by us putting something on the ballot or through a citizen initiative and, and, and so forth. So that's the issue I'm trying to figure out. I, I see nothing wrong with us, as Ms. Brewer said, too, with uh, taking up an issue that has come before us every year anyway and seeking the advice of the public on that. Thank you. So my thought would be, um, what would we learn from the results of this? We would learn that many people in town feel one way about it and many people in town feel another way about it which we already know. And so at this point, we, ha we are using a compromise solution to deal with the fact that people feel very different ways about it. <coughs> if we were going to now say the majority rules, we're going to do what the majority in town wants, then that's, that's really, that's about as opposite of a compromise as you could do. So I would kind of want us to be much clearer before we would put a question out there about what we would intend to do with the results. And I would want to think a lot about the precedent that we're setting of kind of 
um, making decisions based on on a referendum vote. Um, I feel like as a body, we're essentially comfortable. We don't all 100% love our compromise, um, but we're essentially comfortable with it. And if we're not, then we have the opportunity to re-persuade each other every year, thanks to Mr. Kelly. Um, uh, so if, if we're essentially comfortable with the fact that we have a compromise, then we would be saying what by getting the referendum information you know that would that we i think we would have to have a whole nother complicated conversation that would say okay so if 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 this is a split vote from the town what are we going to do with that and so I, I just don't think we're in the place to have that conversation and make that decision people would need to know what this ballot question meant and if we had no idea what the ballot question meant then um it, that, that that doesn't seem uh, that doesn't seem like good planning. It doesn't seem like a responsible way to put a question to the voters to me. So uh, I would not be inclined to do this. Other thoughts, Mr. Wall and then Mr. Hayden? Not, not sure how comfortable we, we all are with that compromise because as I recall, the compromise with itself a split vote. You know, it, w it wasn't a five, it wasn't a five zero vote for the compromise. It was a three two or four one, whatever, depending on the, on, on the issue. So that's just mirrors within mirrors as far as I'm concerned. So my concern has to do with the, uh, your, point about hastily crafting a ballot initiative with an uncertain outcome. But as far as the compromise, I always didn't make much sense to me to begin with, so that carries no weight. Okay, Mr. Hayden. My intellect is still moving through three time zones, west to east, so I may speak uncounseled, um, but I'll be as careful as I can. Um, actually, I appreciate your point, um, um, Stephanie. Um, and I would add to it that um, um, not only would there be a question about what to do with it, but the question as to what it is itself that we're doing is not clear by the, the, the information that I have. So the notion of it being a hastily crafted um, uh, uh, article is, is, I think, maybe important as well. Um, because what we have does not address most of the issues that swirl around this, either either as as a way of solving them, resolving them, or even acknowledging them. Um, and so, um, I appreciate that. Other thoughts over here? But a, a prop to an I apple. I haven't recognized you yet. Um, it, just to Mr. Wild's point, um, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that we were unanimous in the compromise, so I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, that rather we sort of accept as a board that we have this compromise. If we are looking to change each other's mind to change that vote, we always have the opportunity to do that. <laughs> if any of us think that the uh, that that putting the question to the voters is the way to change the minds of the others, then certainly that would be a, a, a valid way to think about this. But I, I didn't want to. I, I apologize. I didn't want you to think I was misrepresenting the select board. But if I did, it was unintentional. Unintentional, Miss Brewer. Um, that is why I actually yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we can use what pieces we want of this. I, I feel like it is something that is part of that compromise conversation that we have every year because we definitely talk about that town meeting vote every year, and I found that town meeting vote to not be particularly meaningful in comparison to a town-wide vote, perhaps for reasons that were stated tonight, perhaps for other reasons, um, and every vote, of course, is a moment in time. There are certainly many, many issues I'm not willing to put before the voters because they are matters of basic human rights that I would not want to put before any set of voters no matter how much I embrace the, the values of a particular voting group. Um, but this feels separate to me and it feels like such a polarizing issue that I still feel like because it's advisory, it doesn't mandate what we do. It's yet another piece of, as I'm repeating myself, it's yet another piece of information. I think there is a question as to whether or not we would want to have the ballot question say, the flags fly on these five days or these seven days or whatever, versus leaving everything else out of it and just talking about September 11th and leaving it there. We may all have multiple feelings about what needs to be done to recognize September 11th's anniversary every year, but this is one piece of it that I think people are able to and some people choose to keep very separate from all their other remembrances of September 11th because of their particular relationship with the flag. So it feels like something that doesn't have to be overly complicated and yet is something that does not become a mandate but simply another piece of information. 
one. Yeah, I hope I didn't imply that I thought you were not portraying the, the full situation. I just meant to, oh, all I meant to say was that it was a compromise, and there again, there was a split vote, and there are winners and losers, and we all agreed to abide by the outcome. So that's, you know, we're back at the divided opinion thing. Um, I guess the, the question I would have then also is, um, what would we be doing? I mean, <laughs> we're, we'd be voting for what? We're voting here in principle for the idea of something that might be crafted somehow by us, by Mr. Kelly later, because we don't have specific language here. We think I have the idea of a, a general if, sounding of public opinion. If, if there was a majority vote by the select board to put a question on the ballot, then the language would need to be created and approved uh, at our next quickly, meeting right. in order to get on the ballot for next Tuesday. That gives me pause, but. So I, I think that stepping away from the issue, and the issue is one that is very emotional. People have very strong feelings about it, and, and the select board has dealt with this a lot. Um, going back to the process part of it, um, I think that <coughs> the ballot is a, is a fairly sacred instrument, and we need to exercise our responsibility with, of access to the ballot very carefully and very thoughtfully. And so anything that happens at the last moment, I think is kind of the opposite of that. So this wasn't some burning issue such that we've been working on it all of this time. It's something that just occurred to Mr. Kelly, so he's brought it to us and we're saying, mm, yeah, maybe. And I'm saying there are a whole bunch of unresolved issues policy-wise, um, specifically as relates to this issue, what we would think we would do with that information and precedent-wise, um, never mind the language part, which would have to go from zero to exactly done and, and approvable next Monday night. So. Um, that to me, there's just there are too many things waiting against doing this at this time. I would note that Mr. Kelly still has the option of a warrant article for town meeting, which would be another path to the ballot. Um, yeah, and we saw how well that you'd worked out the last time. <laughs> that but that would be a different question. You would you could ask town meeting to put it on the ballot if you wanted to do that. Then that would get you know fuller consideration or whatever, I don't know. Um, but you could do your homework on that. Um, so your, your avenues aren't entirely closed, but as far as what the select board's role and responsibility is with our access to the ballot, this just does not seem to me to be a responsible way to approach that at the last minute. Mr. Within Kelly. the 35 days, so it's not last minute. I mean, again, to me, direct democracy is one person, one vote and it's 50% plus one wins. I mean, again, a, a proposition two and a half override can come out of town meeting by a, more than a two-thirds vote and then be defeated at the ballot box. I'll give you an example. <coughs> In the mid-90s, the $4 million, John, you might even remember this, the $4 million town hall renovation override, it came through town meeting 156 to two. I remember it very well because I was one of the two that voted no, the other one was Hill Boss, and then he changed his mind and sent a letter to the Amherst Bulletin saying, I've changed my mind and I want everybody to support this thing. So we're, we're now at 157 to one, and it failed at the ballot box. In fact, it failed twice. Twice that override failed, and then town meeting took out a loan and did it that way, and that's why we sit here today in this building. Um, but again, it was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, 156 to two passed by town meeting and failed at the ballot box. I'm so, not sure what your point is. I'm saying that if, if you can ask town meeting if, if you get a no vote from the select board about putting this on a ballot, you can also try to get town meeting to put it on a ballot, or of course you could try yourself. That, that's my only well, point. Well, then it would be on for next year. I mean, town meeting doesn't start until a month from now. It's, this, it, this has to be decided if, by March 4th if, in order so to get out for this coming 9-11. That's what I'm concerned about. You could do your homework, like I said. I'm not doing my homework on, on this to figure out how you would do it, but um, it's possible you could get on I don't know if you could. Maybe the April 30th or the uh, or the uh, June, whatever the June um, Senate election is. I'm not sure. Again, you'd need to do your homework on this. But otherwise, then, yeah, maybe it would be on the next election. So, Ms. Brewer. I am relatively, despite the fact that I've in some ways hoped for some time that we would have this on a ballot simply so we would have that additional piece of information, um, 
I am also rather persuaded by the fact that although previous select boards used what I thought were not appropriate advisory questions on the ballot, we have been very careful that way. And if this select board's policy and these particular five people at this particular moment in time is to be incredibly cautious and conservative about what we put on the ballot and strongly encourage people to go through their other avenues, which as you say, do exist both through town meeting and through the sim you know, simple but perhaps cumbersome signature process that, that's, that I can live with as a policy decision as long as we don't decide something strange next week and then say, and then I'll say, well, what about, we, didn't, we wouldn't do the flag and obviously we deal with things as they come up. I'm not persuaded by the fact that we have to do that this year for this ballot either from the standpoint that we have known for a decade that people would like to potentially have this on the ballot. There were plenty of opportunities for people to go ahead and gather signatures, just like there were opportunities for changing the form of government. Mm -hmm. So associated with gathering signatures. So it's not like we are the only gatekeepers of the democracy here. There are other options to be followed. Whether the timing can be met this particular time is frankly not our problem. So uh, I understand, I think, the, the need to set a very high bar for the ballot. Um, I just wanted to make sure that this was something we didn't want to keep as an exception to that particular thing because of the various reasons we've already stated this evening. Anyone else? Mr. Hayden. As we move to a close, which I imagine we are now, I just wanted to make one more comment about um, the great deal of gratitude that I have to my colleagues for um, um, their comportment in dealing with this. There have been some very difficult things that this has brought to us, and I appreciate working with uh, people who are so uh, careful at, uh, uh, well, at being careful. Thank you. Does anybody want to make a motion, or are we simply are taking the pulse of the body and not seeing action in our future? Would anyone like to make a motion? I see no purpose. No purpose. Thank you for coming in. See you in September. All right, member reports. JCPC update. Okay, uh, JCPC met on February 14th. Um, we had a presentation by the town clerk who would like a uh, machine to tabulate the votes of the district because at the moment, um, since the machine that they were using broke down six years ago, uh, they have been hand tabulating the results from the districts. So um, that was one uh, request that came before JCPC. Then LSSC um, requested some um, materials for or some capital, had made some capital requests for Mill River. Uh, one is for lifeguard chairs, the other is for two shade canopies because as we all know, the incidence of skin cancer is going up and there is virtually no shade at, at the Mill River pools. And also there were two requests for mowers that are shared by the golf course and by LSSE for the fields. And both of those are over 20 years old and have breakdowns and are impossible to repair. So, did I do okay? You it all. <laughs> okay. And you guys are continuing to meet Respect. until oh, when? Yes. Oh yes, our next meeting is this week. Ms. Poor. Just to clarify for the public something I don't know anything about, but <laughs> the, the voting machines, I mean, we have these wonderful voting machines, we right. put our ballots and we don't do the Active crank thing, things. we don't count things, you know, right. all that works great at individual precincts, so what's the thing that's broken? The central tabulation of the 10 districts of all those for separate the different districts. offices. Okay, so, so it's kind know, of the combined effort. Right. So you're it's not like you're adding works. one some, I mean, right. you know, that'd be easy, but you have people in 10 precincts running for town meeting, you have 
for the other elections you have, you know. So are yeah. all of our individual machines that we're all voting and are working right. just fine right. and providing That's their little fine. printouts that we That's see at right. the time. But it's all the of central that tabulation needs to be at the compiled end. Okay. on a laptop for which, which is broken down in the software. Ah. So okay. they need a new system. Yes, having 10 separate strips of paper right. really doesn't get you all the way to the no, end. No, it doesn't. Okay, got it. Other okay. questions or comments about JCPC? Okay. Other member reports? Ms. Stein? Um, I actually, I have two non-reports first, if I'd, li I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are they then? <laughs> well, they're reports, but they're not my liaison reports. That's what I meant. Um, one is that March 22nd, the Senior Center has a benefit um, called the Senior Follies. That's at 2 p.m. And I can't tell you more of the details except that accomplished performers in many fields perform. And this is a benefit for the Senior Center. And the other is that there is this community read program that the library is running which is um, you go to the library and you can check out, I think they're still available, the book about the wondrous short life of Oscar uh, Well, um, by Juno Diaz. And, um, and the, this is a Pulitzer Prize winning book and the author <coughs> is actually going to be speaking in town at date I cannot give you, but I thought if, you're, if this appeals to you, you can find out all that information at the library. Um, and my only liaison report is from the personnel board, which met on February 13th, and we discussed the three proposed 3% increase in the budget and what would be the increase in non-union wages as part of that overall budget. Um, we discussed the fact that there would be health insurance holidays as sort of bonuses in a way. Um, and we discussed the supervisory leadership program of which 14 of the town staff are participating. And also that there will be an annual, the annual meeting of the non-union town employees is March 20th at nine o'clock in this very room. Did I leave anything out? That meeting is with me and with uh, members of the personnel board. Right. Questions or comments for Ms. Stein? Other liaison representative reports? <coughs> Mr. Eaton. <coughs> very briefly, um, the, um, the Recycling Refuse Management Committee will be uh, their, their, to their final draft on the recommendation for um, the transfer station and pretty close to the final draft on a proclamation um, demanding that we put together a zero waste committee. So we, we have that to look forward to. Um, I also wanted to report that um, there are three Amherst College students um, who are now working mostly with Alan Snow, um, uh, but a little bit with the Public Trade Tree Committee as well to, um, to uh, work through uh, trade policy, uh, trade, tree policy issues. Um, and speaking of students, I'm hopeful to have one for the summer to do translation, um, uh, po probably for Amherst Media, um, to uh, help get some of the, the, uh, the shows that they're about town government um, into a second language. So. Perfect, thank you. Questions for Ms. Hayden, Ms. Stein. I just wanted to add to um, Mr. Hayden's report that we again had a donation from the Hadley Garden Center of a large number of trees to help us in our tree um, goals for this community. Thank you. Other liaison reports? <laughs> Mr. Wald. <laughs> <coughs> If I can be, just begin with a non-report to, to echo what Ms. Stein said about, <laughs> <coughs> about the library. You know, I think I've been very impressed by the extent to which the library has really been generating a lot of public outreach programs. I think it's just wonderful. So I'm glad Ms. Stein paid attention to that and acknowledged it here publicly. Uh, the Historical Commission met on February 5th. This is the last part of their part of the end, unending story. Um, about the barn on Lincoln Avenue. As you recall, they declined to issue a demolition delay. Uh, 
the developer went and demolished it, even though neighbors were appealing the demolition permit. Kind of a catch-22 thing, too, about when that all takes place. And so, because the zoning bylaw lives, yeah, the, the demolition delay bylaw lives within a zoning bylaw, the appeal went to the Zoning Board of Appeals, which asked the Historical Commission to reconsider it, which it did over the course of two meetings, continued finally till February 5th, where they took up the issue again at great length, and once again found that the structure did not have historical significance, actually by a larger margin, uh, and did not then, of course, take any action. The building already have been demolished anyway. So but it, it was, you know, it's again, it's an, it's an illustration of the difficult choices we face, where sometimes the law doesn't quite capture the, the, the problem. So uh, there was a concern about the structure itself, but about larger questions of neighborhood character and development and so forth. So that, that whatever happens in this case, that issue is not going away. But Zoning Board of Appeals will take it up again later to, to hear formally the Historical Commission finding and, and discuss among themselves. Thank you. Questions or comments from Mr. Wall? Ms. Brewer? Having um, fortunately only attended a small portion of those sections of meetings, I would just ask that I hope that eventually it becomes clear whether or not there is something else that might be done in terms of process or structure to make people feel like um, that re everything really is being heard in a timely fashion. I mean, the fact that they came to the same decision indicates the process works, yet there might be ways of, of improving the process in a way that makes it more intelligible to people from the outside so that there isn't quite the frustration level, even if disagreement is going to continue to occur, but at least agreement about the process. Um, Mr. Walden, then Mr. Mussini. I think the process works fine. I mean, part of the problem, of course, is that when it's sometimes on a, on a, on a tight timeline, because we, we found this with the historic uh, district ordinance, too, you know, it's like with our open meeting law, you have to post things a certain amount of time in advance. In, in case of a demolition permit, you've got to act within X number of days, and so then you've got to get the material and forward to the commission and post the meeting and decide to hold a hearing. So we're sometimes caught in, in, in those, uh, between those competing ob goals too. You want to act quickly for the property owner, whoever it is, so that there's not a delay in whatever's going on, and you want to give the public time to, uh, to react. But as far you know, as the meetings were conducted, in my opinion, in the normal fashion and with the appropriate information, so I don't think the process is the issue here. Mr. Mazzanti. Um, I think um, despite if you're a person who was not in agreement with the judgment that was rendered uh, uh, twice, uh, I think, you know, it, I think objectively you can say the, the process as it's currently devised, it worked, quote unquote. Um, I've encouraged staff and town council and encouraged through them to the historical commission to spend some time in the postmortem here talking about, okay, what, 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 what things worked really well with the current process and how might we make the process better for, you know, the next time. Because there will be a next time on something. Uh, related to demolition delay and you know so I'm encouraging them to offer recommendations and we might improve upon the process mr. Heaton and Mr. Wall. Um, at, the, at the risk of uh, taking too much time on this one one report um, I want to appreciate the the the, the, po the that the postmortem is being done but as I understand it or I'm hopeful uh, from what little I know I, I'm hopeful that the postmortem includes the fact that um, it seems that um, the demolition delay was um, uh, trying to be used as a tool, an inappropriate tool, to combat a very real problem, the real problem of, of um, neighborhood invasion by um, um, developers who are just taking neighborhoods and turning them into student residences. Um, demolition delay is not a good tool for that. And, you know, the process, as far as I know, and again, I don't know everything, um, was, was well-founded and executed correctly and sort of in a way it's been done for a while successfully, um, which is all to say I appreciate that there are efforts at creating the tools that we do need to control the, pro the real problem, uh, which is not probably the demolition delay process. Thank you. Mr. Wall. Yeah, just very briefly, I think Mr. Murray Hayden put it well. That's part, you know, the, the problem is in some sense the standards are very technical, in some sense they're common sense but very subjective. So 
that's really that's what all this comes down to. Uh, as far as what Mr. Mizanti said, one of the things we might want to do, and I believe town council would be in favor of this probably too, just in the basis of general practice, would be to take the demolition delay bylaw out of the zoning bylaw because that brings about all sorts of other uh, procedural issues. And the commission itself, I think, wants to talk about what happens. You know, <coughs> what does it mean to impose a delay? What can be done in the interim to try to save a structure if someone, want, one party wants to take it down, others are opposed, and so forth. And again, the question of appropriateness, I know Ms. Brewer has raised this too, and Ms. Faye on the commission brought up the issue last time because we often say a local historic district ordinance might, would actually apply to cases such as this, which is true. But as Ms. Faye warned and Ms. Brewer has said, we don't want to delude ourselves into thinking or encourage others to think that a uh, local historic district is a panacea, much less a means of blocking development because development is going to happen and it has to happen, but it has to be appropriate and in the right places. So again, really important question about tools and, and tasks. Thank you. Other questions or comments about that? All right, other liaison reports. Ms. Brewer. I'm looking at all my little acronyms going, do I even remember what these things mean? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, CDBG. We, of course, just talked about that at our last meeting, and we know that the application was submitted, and we know that we won't hear for a long time, so that's kind of irritating, <coughs> but that's just the way these things work. And so I'm very pleased that we were able to make all the effort of getting that application in for the additional funds and hoping that we will be able to get more than the transition funds we were sort of promised. Um, bear, everyone to bear in mind, the reason I bring this up is that the CDBG Advisory Committee's group's work is not completed simply because that application is done. What they are going to be doing next, and you can follow on the town website and look at the town website calendar, is they will be looking at reviewing the utilization of the current grants because obviously, you know, were we to continue to be able to fund these various agencies, we want to ensure that the things that they applied for are the things that they turned out to be the right things that they wanted to fund and that people showed up for them and all that kind of good stuff. So um, the Black Grant Com Advisory Committee has been doing a really good job of kind of connecting those pieces on the year-round basis. So something to look forward to. Um, our next BCG meeting is, as I understand it, still on plan to be on Thursday, March 7th at 8.30 in the morning. Is that correct? Or are <laughs> we going to change Maybe. that? <laughs> Maybe. So that's something to watch out for. It's not as exciting as joint capital planning, talking about individual <laughs> fun things to buy or not that we need desperately. Um, but it is a good feel for how everybody's budget process is going because, for example, we had a relatively quiet discussion about the budget tonight. The schools are not having very quiet discussions right now. so. It's good to be able to check in on a coordinated basis with them, so that's lovely. Moving on, Housing and Sheltering Committee is having a forum about the housing production plan that has been put together by the consultants that Town Meeting funded, and that is going to be at the same time as the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. <clears throat> <laughs> So that'll be lovely. So people have plenty of places to go. Plus Ignite Amherst is that time, so I'm going to that. So yeah, we'll all be split many different directions, but lots of fun things to do next Tuesday the 5th. Um, and of course, materials also available on the website for people who can't go to the meeting or don't want to go to the meeting. The housing production plan should be up there. Now, my big thing, of course, is the regionalization of the elementary schools, <laughs> what's happening associated with that. We had a little bit of a break with school break week in there. Um, Leverett and Shootsbury are having forums this Wednesday and Thursday night to follow up on the meeting that many of you were able to attend on Saturday the 2nd, where our educational and financial consultants presented. Originally, Amherst had hoped to do its follow-up forum to that on February 13th. Various, some various circumstances changed. That didn't work out. Of course, then we had break week. So again, Leverett and Shootsbury are meeting this week. Pelham and Amherst are both meeting in separate locations on Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 2nd at 10 a.m., this coming Saturday, the 2nd at 2 p.m. in a different school building is the Four Towns meeting as well. So there goes your Saturday. Welcome to public service. And <laughs> then after the Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shootsbury, individual towns have their forums in response to what we learned on February 2nd. Then the four towns that are on the Reg Regional School District Planning Board, the one with the B at the end instead of the C at the end, will meet on Saturday, March 9th 
at 9 a.m. to talk about whether or not to have a vote as to whether or not to continue to move forward to look at regionalization. Some people have misunderstood what's going to happen on that day. We're obviously not making any sort of final decision about anything that day because all of this eventually needs to be presented to the voters. But we, at uh, that's kind of a take of the pulse of where we are situation. That's an opportunity, you know, because this ha this regulation has to apply to all sorts of towns and all sorts of circumstances that might not have the wonderful re working relationship like we already do. From seven to twelve, it gives them the opportunity to walk away. <clears throat> I have no reason to believe anyone will be wanting to do that on the ninth. But that is one of those check-in points where we have this discussion. Were we to decide as a four town body, not to be confused with the four towns meeting, as a four town body to continue to move forward on regionalization, again, we're looking at a schedule for the fall, although I have to put the little asterisk next to it because we didn't get a CIC grant for our regionalization effort. And if you look at the education things that were funded, there just wasn't a lot of money to go around. And there was not any, it isn't like some other group that was going to regionalize their schools got the money and we didn't. It was for some very specific projects. So we're having to relook at our timeline based on the grant funding we do have already to see, okay, if we decide to move forward on the 9th, what does that mean in terms of can we keep with our timeline? Do we have to push some pieces various places? But there's tons of information on the website, which is regionalschoolplanning.com. And there is also being posted the answers to sort of a frequently asked question thing based on questions that have come up so far in the process and those will be continued to be updated. So if you can't come to that meeting that morning because we you plan to go to the four towns in the afternoon and have things to do with your family in the morning, um, those you can again look at all that material that's online and continue to send questions to the email that's also available on the website. Thank you. Um, so again, the... Uh 10 a.m. meeting for Amherst is where? In the high school library. And then the Four Towns meeting is in the middle school library in the afternoon. Okay. High school library at 10 o'clock on Saturday the 2nd is the Amherst meeting. So this is going to be... Um, this is going to be more of a direct question and answer thing. So the, the thing that many of us and much of the community went to a couple of weeks ago was more kind of a presentation. As from an, it was this kind of one way. More yeah. of a hearing from people. Right. Do you have an answer to this question yet? Do you have an answer to that question yet? Yes, we have answers to this. No, we don't know about this. And this is when this will come up in the process. But it's the opportunity for the individual towns to talk more about their individual concerns. Great. So that's a really important meeting that we should, um, whether we can attend or, or not ourselves, um, we should be encouraging the community to attend because this is their big opportunity to get a lot of questions answered um, and, and concerns raised to help you guys decide w what you're going to do moving forward. So a uh, very important meeting for the community. Thank you. And it is based, you know, just with the three Amherst representatives, myself, Catherine Oppy from the school committee, and Andy Steinberg from the finance committee, who will be fresh back from a vacation. So can ask them all kinds of hard questions. But again, we won't have answers to all the questions because there's a lot of work to be done before it gets presented to town meetings and to the uh, to the general population. So okay. more to come. Thank you. Um, and the, the funding issue, talking about what might change your timeline, uh, that's the, the ability to afford an election or there's other things that were related uh, we, to that? Because we need legal assistance to help us craft an actual regional agreement where we to get to the point of the various component pieces to be looking at help with collective bargaining and the different groups. So, you know, we laid kind of everything out. If we get the one grant, we'll do it this time period and the other grant because, you know, they always have time limitations on when you can use them. And we'll do this period and say, like, oh, now that period's not funded anymore. So now what can, what can we do to try and make up for that? So we will be reviewing that, those details, because again, trying to get rid of these forums and figure that part out like, oops, now we don't need money, um, we will talk about at the meeting on the 9th as well. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. That's very unfortunate to have missed the grant just for the ways that ties your hand behind your back. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions or comments for Ms. Brewer? other reports or Mr. Hayden? Or non reports. Actually I have a question for my colleagues as to what they're doing on March eleventh. <laughs> March eleventh. This is by way of announcing the uh, the empty bowls. Empty bowls. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, serving for shift. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm there. I'll be eating soup so I can serve soup on the second shift. <laughs> All right. Excellent work. All right.
right. Um, so the thing that I do most these days is safe and healthy neighborhoods. We'd already talked about that, so that's good enough for my liaison report. Um, <laughs> she is so the, done with that. <laughs> we, uh, we did talk about the warrants, so um, we all need to sign the warrants before we leave here. These are the warrants for the April 9th uh, ta annual town election and then the April 30th special election. We don't have any other minutes or anything to deal with, is that correct? That is correct. All right, then I will make the executive session motion. So uh, I move that the select board go into executive session per Massachusetts general law, chapter <coughs> 30A, section 21, part A, subset three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining because a discussion in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body. The select board will not return to public session at the conclusion of executive session. Second. A roll call vote. Thank you. Brewer, aye. Stein, aye. O'Keefe, aye. Wald, aye. Hayden, aye. And then uh, this uh, open meeting uh, adjourns at 826, <coughs> and we will see you again next Monday night. We meet next Monday on March 4th. So see you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>